me begin by saying that one could think of reason, and this is not against the idea of translation studies. If you look at what I published, a series here or not? Yes, there you are. If you look at what um, I published, I'm talking about uh, uh, the necessity for some of us in the margins, not a lot of us, to say a few things again and again because we will come to the articulation of a persistent critique of what we cannot not want. Uh, you're writing that down, very nice, but on the other hand, it has to come from, uh, internalized from yourselves. It's a hard thing, a persistent critique of what we, universitarians, who can all join in the same room, what we cannot not want, knowledge through power, power through knowledge, this is, this is what keeps us moving. This is what, even when, I mean, talking about female beauty, imagine a woman like myself, childless, eaten three husbands. I am defined in uh, the tradition as a, a, a failure, a complete failure. What keeps me moving here at the head of this room? Power through knowledge. This is not something that you cannot not want. So to an extent, this persistent critique of a certain group, it's not something that will stop translation studies or any studies. It helps us to be human. It's a very different thing. It's, it's, more, it's more basic than whatever you're studying or writing on or whatever. It's more upstream as Ronald Dworkin, uh, one of our uh, best moral philosophers, who certainly was not a deconstructivist. As Ronald Dworkin would say, it's upstream from any study what I'm talking about, and it doesn't, uh, you, uh, want, we need to remember this. So I would suggest that let us think of uh, 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 the kind of reason that gives us rational choice as the capacity to produce syllogisms. You know, like uh, man is mortal, Socrates is a man, Socrates is mortal, right? That three uh, step, I'm saying this only, please don't feel ins insulted because uh, fourth year undergraduates at Columbia University sometimes don't know what syllogism means. So therefore you have to bear the burden of their ignorance, okay? So, so man is mortal, Socrates is a man, Socrates is mortal, that thing. And even, all human beings are capable of producing syllogisms, even top primates. And I'm going to tell you a story because this is easily said, but the story actually illustrates it in an empirical way, like walking uh, all uh, along the world. Two summers ago, in my schools, you know, it gets exceedingly hot in Western West Bengal. Dry and hot, unlike Calcutta, which is wet and hot, and that's what I'm used to. I like to sweat, but not in my villages, you know. So therefore, at night, um, I sleep outside like everybody else, but I will not sleep without a mosquito net. So here I am sleeping, you know, string caught, and the mosquito net is uh, uh, tied to the trees here and there, and the bamboo pole of the cow shed, and so on and so forth. I'm sleeping away. Suddenly, an extraordinary upheaval. Now, I know there are snakes, but I have a mosquito net and I'm on a cot. So it, there can't be that size snake that to upheave my, uh, my bed. So I say, what the hell, you know? I mean, are there tigers here or what? So, okay, well, I'm sleeping. So in the morning, I'm told that it was the smallest goat, which was not tethered because it's a child goat, and it was scratching its back by running under the string cot. It had now, it, is, it had to jump because the string cot is higher than its back. So it had figured out, here is a thing, it is higher than my back. If I jump, I will scratch my back. Because nobody slept there before. It was the first night that someone was sleeping there. That's a syllogism of a rough kind. So, you know, so unfortunately the next night I wouldn't have minded, I would have known what it was, but uh, the uh, uh, peasant's wife 
uh, tethered the little goat. But it taught me something. So therefore, the, uh, all human beings are capable of producing syllogisms and high primates. So uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the real problem is what are the permissible narratives that with which we clothe the syllogisms, yeah? So to an extent, this uh, living in the United States, what I, I was just telling Ashley the other day, because we were like, um, we thought that, the, uh, that enlightened practice was to be like the British. When I was in school, what we learned was the British culture of, you know, trench coats with a mink lining. That is to say, you say that you don't work at all, that, you know, uh, you, that you've done nothing, and so on and so forth, okay? That is also a kind of cultural self-representation where the ones who are properly educated know that that isn't true, okay? So that's a different thing. Then I come to the United States and I find it's the exact opposite. If I say I've done nothing, I don't really work, then I'm not gonna get my fellowship. And there, there people think that, and now of course the United States, uh, Britain is like a little uh, colony of the United States, so it has changed. I'm talking about when I was a young girl. So uh, the, in the United States, this is taken to be, and more or less um, uh, everywhere, it in, I mean in this kind of um, culture, sort of Europe now has these abominable things called <coughs> clusters of excellence, which is like, it's, well, let's not go there. So uh, the, um, this notion of, uh, of selling yourself being human nature, that is also, you see, when one is within a culture, which is why learning cultures is impossible, when a culture is really working, people think that's human nature. So my anthropologist friends are exceedingly shocked when I say that what the incest taboo does is move you from nature to human nature not from nature to culture. So, but the, this thing, because human nature is within quotes, so therefore you clothe the syllogism in human nature, okay? So that the thunder can either be the voice of uh, Jupiter or it can be Benjamin Franklin. So therefore, what we have, what, when we decide that the minimal description of rational choice with, a, with the human being being completely identified with the intending subject, when we know better than that. This is, this is our way of clothing our syllogisms. It's not a bad one, but it's not finally the objective one. You know, there is, this is, the word objective, it is always questionable. It is what we cannot not want. What we cannot not want. We, in this room, I don't mean we human beings. And we human beings too, perhaps. But that's where we are putting reason. So what I was looking at yesterday is, and please remember to ask me questions about these things, okay? So, and I had good questions yesterday, and I want better questions today. The, so what, we, um, what I was talking about yesterday was the scene of translation, yes? The uh, scene in the sta sense of staging, translation, how it is staged. If we think it is not, remember that theory itself, I mean, if we go, it's an English word, it's a um, romance language word, and so, therefore, we have to go to Greek if we want to. I mean, it's, you, Greek etymology is not going to give you uh, the idea of theory everywhere in the world. But we are speaking in English, you all are into English, and so on, although you have different mother tongues and so on, but remember, English is the instrument of globality. So, therefore, what we are looking at here is the uh, theater of translation, remembering that theorein is also to make visible. It, the same, same, etym if you want to be an etymologistic person, which is not always correct because of the history of uh, words, nonetheless, just for the sake of making a beginning, one has to realize that this making visible of translation alone center stage is that 
desire of, of uh, what we cannot not want. I'm going to talk about this today, and I did yesterday, and that's why I'm beginning here. The, so, because otherwise, if we take, as I said yesterday, translation studies rationally conducted, especially, let me say, uh, pragmatic linguistics, what we call pragmatic linguistics. You know, if we take that, I mean, when it goes to the extreme of organization, if we take that as simply a given occupying center stage, then we begin by begging the question. And we know what begging the question means, taking as demonstrated what we are out to prove, right? So therefore, what we have to, we have to think about not when we are doing pragmatic linguistics, because that is extremely useful, but it should be on tap, not on top, to dismiss everything else. And in order to be able to use it properly for the benefit of translation, we, I mean, anybody who says quantification is uh, unimportant is a fool. It's because it is quantification that gives us, uh, first of all, the ingredients for moving ahead. And second of all, let me tell you another story. I, Amatya Sen, who is a, a man from uh, my um, uh, neck of the woods, is, uh, lived on the same street, and so he's like my homeboy, if you know that American word. Uh, when he got the Nobel Prize, Partho Chatterjee and I laughed uh, together and said, let's go lick his feet, which is a a terrible Bengali expression, neither Partha Chatterjee nor I are foot lickers. But, so we were uh, being ironic, said, oh, Pachati Cholo. So we went to the UN where he was celebrating, uh, celebrating, not celebrating, but he was helping uh, out and attending the funeral of Mehbubul Haq, who, with whom he had produced the Human Development Index, which we all use. There was a time in the world when there was no Human Development Index, right? And Amartya told this story. He said that uh, when they were both at Cambridge and Mehbubul Haq produced the index, Mehbub said he, uh, human development is such a complicated thing. Can we really do it in this horrible way? And so Mehbubul Haq said what Marx had said. And uh, you know, when the Communist League accused him of being a capitalist, that in order to be able to fight the GDP, you've got to have a weapon that's, that's as vulgar as the GDP. So the Human Development Index has to be as vulgar as uh, the uh, GDP. Okay, so therefore, in the same way, if you do not inf use quantification, you are not going to be able to withstand, you're going to be laughed out of court as impractical, which I am uh, quite often. On the other hand, the usefulness of people like me is to say that one must see this, that on tap rather than on top, it's not my remark, it's Sass, Thomas Sass's remark, very useful. In order to be able to use such a powerful weapon, you have to train the subject and ask for whom, to what end, what is efficiency. Trains run on time. Remember this, we're in Italy. The fascism was the most efficient uh, way of working. What is efficiency? For what? I was so happy there was so much noise in the room before I was saying uh, to James, uh, before we began, because there are places in the world where before, especially a, a kind of a scary type of older woman is going to give a talk, the whole room is like it's a funeral, you know? <laughs> but, you know, so, but that's not how it was here. And that was a wonderful thing because that's what we ask. That's the difference between, let's say, Dhaka Airport and Frankfurt, but not New York, thank God. So I'll come back to the, how is the city uh, uh, translational because I saw Sherry Simons very wonderful. You're not here in the audience, are you? No, uh, uh, not yet. So uh, the uh, very useful uh, uh, essay, I was looking at it. I'll come back to that. But so we ask, what is efficiency? 
What is it to be efficient? At what cost? When are we efficient? And when are we not? This is another question. When, as human uh, persons, are we not efficient? And what do we lose? By what existential impoverishment is bought at the cost of efficiency or quantification? You have to ask that question. So what, uh, what for whom, to what end, et cetera. And then you will begin to see that the uh, using otherwise, the rational choice quantifiers, they are the ones who are on the ivory tower, not we. So this is very much uh, another place that has begun. Okay, so today what I want to uh, begin with then is the, uh, not yet, the Palomino, uh, Palomino um, uh, email, uh, Palomino um, uh, installation. And, but I want to say first that this is, I want to give you some examples. What I said yesterday was, what happens when, the, uh, talking about the scene of translation, I was saying, what happens when a Spanish person, a Catalan, but that was in Spanish, what was, uh, he was taking notes in Spanish. Um, what, that's another story, why, you know, Gramsci, Italian and Sardinian, that's complete another story, we're not going there. There's so much to say when one ta starts talking about translation. But at any rate, the, so he was taking notes in Spanish and he says, they, right? They, he writes they, he translates it of rather than will to. Okay, uh, and you do not correct him. I did not correct him, you'll see on the, because the, what the they is actually doing is not, is perhaps related to what the two is actually doing. So th it is kind of the untranslatable constitutive border of translation. It's the difference, it's a kind of difference, okay, within translation for which the analogy would be, the analogy would be, it's not the same, please. The analogy, and all analogies are false, but the, the analogy would be the ontico, ontological difference, eh? that very famous that, you know, what you live, the ontic, you cannot catch in what you philosophize, the ontological. There is uh, an irreducible difference between the ontic and the ontological. The ontic must take into account, as I'm sitting here, I don't know my, the inside of my body, it may be that I'm just starting my terminal disease. I wouldn't know. My, and I wouldn't know what the hormones are doing. I don't, ha I don't have any idea. It's the ontic and the ontological as I'm making my theory. There's a difference. The same kind of difference there is, and in fact Gramsci uh, talks about this, which is totally destroyed in the English translation, believe me. I'm not a good, hmm? Uh, he's talking about epistemic or epistemological, method or methodological. It's totally destroyed. The English translators ignore this. You know, the, uh, the difference epistemic or epistemological, this is not, not now quite Gramsci, there is like epistemology is how we construct our uh, objects for knowing, right? Fine. The episteme, that is to say, you know, within what framework we think this is human nature type stuff, we cannot, we, everybody will, will self-declare rupture. We are all completely different because of the digital, etc. It's people coming later who will say what the epistemic difference was. We can't do it. So that is also a difference between the epistemic and the epistemological. And there's the same kind of difference between this layer of language where it is quite possible, Saussure in fact even talks about this. The, uh, the, I mean, we think of Saussure these days as a grandfather, great grandfather, but not really completely a developed uh, linguist and so on, but he talks about this. The, the, uh, the uh, idea uh, that there is a certain constitutive untranslatable border where it's no use saying, hey, two would be a correct translation where you put they because it is quite possible that that is in fact the uh, mediation that you talk about, Stefano, that that is the correct one. Translation is not a, uh, a uh, transposing of synonyms. 
And so that's why I also gave that other explanation, a, a example in Birmum, which I won't give. But this stuff can also, and I want to read some stuff that comes from Italian, uh, translating into English. Uh, and the, 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 uh, I translated a story by Mahasheta Devi. I've translated many stories by Mahasheta Devi. This one I call Stono Daini. Okay, Stono means uh, breast, breast giver it is called. And I have written there that the woman, fine Bengali speaker, fine, I suppose, Bengali writer, I don't know her, but on the other hand, she decided that the title was wet nurse. Now, in Bengali, there is a word, stonodaini, which means, which can be translated wet nurse, although it ignores the fact of stonno being breast milk. It's okay. You can translate it, uh, um, uh, what call it, wet nurse. But stonodaini was a deliberate moving away from the colloquial. So that Mahasheta was making the point that what this woman, the urban subaltern, was giving was her body. Because remember, she dies of breast cancer, right? So this is, uh, this is something that the translator ignored. Okay, now if you will forgive me, this is a recent uh, article in the New York Review of Books. I want to give these examples because you see, tomorrow's thing, Rosa Luxemburg, I can also uh, compress, so not a problem. And then we'll go to Palomino. Here are the examples. Can, the article asks, can we, uh, can we communicate something that runs contrary to my expectations? And then it goes on to say, it's by a man called Pike, you can look it up, May 9th, New York Review of Books. How f someone sent it to me. How far will I allow it to do so? This is a subject question. Subject question. Reducing the text to something more conventional, the size of my ignorance. The size of my ignorance, okay? So the, um, the, 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 it, it, he gives a translation. Lawrence's Women in Love, okay? Isn't it an amazing thing how strong the temptation is not to? And then Lawrence comment, the text comments, they, they both laughed looking at each other. In their hearts, they were frightened. I'm talking about literary translation here. That's also part of what you do. And I could, when I gave the talk in New York, I talked about the translation that is most powerful in the world today, which is the do-it-yourself things. And because of the way capitalism now is, the factory floor has been pulverized, a thing is made in China, and then it is assembled um, in um, Saudi Arabia, then it moves to Mexico for uh, distribution and so on, and so therefore the do-it-yourself, uh, I'm going there so that you don't think I'm only talking about literary translation, the, and so what they do is a team, I talked about this in New York, and this is well known, this is the largest translation lobby in the world now. So the do-it-yourself instructions, a whole group translates it from the place where it's made into English. Then another group translates the English back into the original language. Then it is retranslated back into English, Japanese, some of the languages that are uh, taken to be powerful in the world. So until it is felt that there is objective agreement, okay? So this kind of are we translating the nuance toward this, what we cannot not want, that is to say, to assemble the cheap thing we have brought? This is what I'm now critiquing at the other end from literary translation. I hope you see what I'm, what I'm uh, trying to do, and through the, the help of this guy, Pike. Anyway, so the, the Lawrence writes, the, um, they both laughed, looking at each other. In their hearts, they were frightened. Hmm? Okay. But the Italian translators, the, if I ask a class of students to translate this into Italian, approximately half will introduce a but between the two sentences. Because they read the text like that. They think that the idea of um, being not being nervous cannot produce laughter. They feel that the laughter shows that they're not really afraid. Whereas what Lawrence is trying to show is that you laugh to conquer your fear. 
you are very afraid, which is why, in fact, I criticized you about laughing, because that unease on the part of women and men together, laughing at a woman being basically insulted in public, a feminist woman, that's the whole thing. It's a laughter of unease. You wouldn't be amused at my expense, would you? And that's what you were. So to an extent, this introduction of the but, it's almost like an ekphrasis here of the situation of gender. Since we're moving, you know what ekphrasis means? Certainly um, seniors in, at Columbia, fourth year undergraduates do not know. So I will tell you what ekphrasis means. It's when the entire action of uh, something is represented in a small space. The typical Western example is Achilles' shield, and the typical uh, example coming from um, the majority population in my state is uh, Krishna's Vishwarupa Darshana, when he uh, opens his mouth and shows the entire story of the epic Mahabharata to Arjuna. That's ekphrasis. So to an extent, that, that's what's in this story. The relationship between fear and laughter, which the Italian translators are making more conventional by reading it as if there is a but between the two. You see, it's not the knowledge of language. It's the inability to access what is neither rational nor irrational, but literary. Then he goes on to say, this is a very important uh, text. The, um, I'm going to skip one. I'm going to read one. Do we as readers make these corrections? And translation is the most intimate act of reading. That's me. Okay, and then he's talking about uh, Virginia Woolf's uh, um, Mrs. Dalloway. What is, it's not a safe thought, he writes. These are not fashionable or safe thoughts. The fact that this novel presents the suicide of one of its characters as a gift of individual to collective. This is an extraordinarily uh, difficult idea. But what they do is they are not able to translate this I'll give it to you, when Septimus Warren in the text says, the Italian translation offers lo volete voi, which in English literally is, it's you who want it, or more idiomatically, you asked for it. Was the translator aware she had altered the text, the deep and uncolloquial and disturbing, unsafe meaning of the text? And then he goes back into English, he says that there is, after Machiavelli writes about Cesare Borgia, he writes, uh, raccolte io adunque tutte le azioni del duco non saprei riprenderlo. Literally, having gathered then all the actions of the duke, I would not know how to reproach him. The translator, on the other hand, writes, so having summed up all that the duke did, I cannot possibly, which is not in the Italian, I cannot possibly censure him, which is a very different kind of word. Um, uh, Bull has, I mean, the translator, English translator, has Machiavelli insist that he has no moral objections to anything Cesare Borgia did, whereas what Machiavelli is saying is that Borgia didn't make any big mistakes. So to an extent, this uh, rewriting the text in the, uh, in the human nature version of your own language or the relationship between uh, British possessive individualism and an idea of Machiavelli, or the impossibility of understanding the use of laughter to cover fear, or the impossibility of understanding the peculiar case of offering suicide as an individual gift to the collective. This kind of stuff, that's something, and, and I'm, I put this together because he was talking about his Italian students. This is like the they, on the other hand, in the case of the they, you have to distinguish stonodaini. Those are mistakes. You can correct them. But in the case of the they, you have to distinguish. So it's not all the same that that's the margin, the constitutive margin of translation, where the, untra the tr uh, translatable and the untranslatable come together. So I wanted to talk about this. Now let's look. Uh, no, wait a second. I also wanted to bring something else here, which I hope spoke to you. Well, the, I asked you to, well, I don't expect you to have read it. I asked you to read and read it at your leisure when you're home. 
I gave it because uh, um, Sadia Abbas said in public in New York City, she made a little sh list for, for Islamic feminists who are not just excusing Islam, a, a, a short uh, checklist for what they should read. And she mentioned, I'd forgotten about it, she mentioned this piece, Fuku and Najibullah. So if it's so useful to uh, women from another religion to which my so-called religion has a genocidal relationship, I thought that this is something that I should look at again. I did write it, I should look at it again. And there, if you look at it, you will see that I write about an archive, I, I write about a covenant given by Abdul Rahman in 1896, the Amir of Afghanistan, who, and in this, covenant, and he has many covenants, and this one he is writing to bring all of the various groups that make up Afghanistan together. And this is 1896. And of course, when one goes in to create the Taliban in order to take a position against the, against the Russians, one doesn't think about the history of Afghanistan. Afghanistan is pre presented as something that is completely without history, as it were, a primitive place. So to an extent, the, what I do in Fuku and Najibullah is I look at how that covenant is translated into English. And I go, it was not hard for me, why? Because although my own, and I, uh, another essay I asked you to read, although my own essay, own uh, language, native language, was cleaned of its Arabic and its, its Farsi loan words in the 19th century in the name of that very majority that has now become genocidal against Islam, in order to deny our wonderful uh, Islamic imperial history, the, and, I, and you have it in the published work that I've given you to read, although that is so, the jurisprudential language in my uh, native language, Bengali, is in fact Arabic and Farsi loanwords, because of course the law came to us through that, uh, those languages. And so therefore, the, I, since I don't belong to a group that has decided that Bengali is only from Sanskrit, one of you asked me this question, yesterday, and I realized that I'm actually dealing with people who probably have no idea about any, about my language at all. But nonetheless, the, um, um, so uh, I'm not, I don't belong to that group, a kind of Islamophobic denial of some of our, um, uh, our loan words. The, the, uh, therefore, I have some sense of Arbi and Farsi, and I'm good at languages. And so I was able to sit down with Hamid Dabashi and uh, read uh, the covenant uh, to the extent that Hamid said to me, you sure you don't know Farsi and Dari? I said, yes, I'm quite sure, Hamid, I couldn't have done it alone. But <laughs> nonetheless, we read together, and what came clear to him, to him as well, because he hadn't noticed this. The, he's not an English teacher. He's a teacher of, of Persian stuff, right? Whereas I am a teacher of English, the majority language, too, as the <laughs> Pakistani cab driver said, Gore ko angrezi padate hai aap. So this is, I'm not going to translate that one. But uh, so anyway, the, uh, so therefore, uh, this idea of how the translation constructed a picture of the uh, Iron Army of Afghanistan, so that Afghanistan could be seen as having a subject that was completely primitive to the Enlightenment. This Fuku and Najibullah, in fact, has a very detailed analysis of translation practice, and you should take a look at it. So therefore, I've given you an example of uh, the, uh, the, the breast giver, which was translated as wet nurse. I've given you those examples from the Italian translations that I saw in the New York, uh, New York Review of Books last week. And I have also tried to talk about other kinds of mistranslations of this sort and made a distinction between that and Palomino. You see, this is why I said all this. It's not the same thing. There are varieties of mistranslations and we must be able to put ourselves in a position to be able to judge, and therefore the intending subject cannot be completely dismissed. Reasonableness cannot be dismissed. Judgment comes from reasonableness, but we must 
protect that reasonableness by realizing that our reasonableness, like the goat's reasonableness, has a limit. The goat was as reasonable as I am when I open an umbrella in the rain. It's the same level of reasonableness. That thing is a little bit high. I'm a small goat. I must jump to scratch my back. That ain't a bad uh, reasonableness. It's like the opening the umbrella in the rain, right? So, therefore, we have to, that's what I was saying. Let us not identify this and let us not think about mistranslations. Correct him, it's of English grammar. That's something that we must not uh, do. We must be able to judge between. Because remember, you're producing stats, it'll come out as a mistranslation. So that's where I'm at, okay? So now, can we, can we just look at Palomino? And we'll go forward to something else. slowly. And I have my email exchange right at the end so that you can see I've said nothing about correcting the text. Palomino, it's just called Palomino. There we go. And we can move through. You know, this is how the inspiration is. It begins. So in order to move through, I just could do that sideways thing. Okay. So this is this is how he does it, and, the, and, then, and he sends me this saying, uh, this, is, this is the uh, Spanish, uh, Spanish uh, uh, the, uh, I did something with the occupiers, etc. The Spanish description of Gaiti Suvac, this is the translation uh, of the thing, this is all in the catalog, and then this is an uh, email he sends me, a fortune with all your projects and so on, and he writes, etc. what? Huh? Yes, and uh, this one is, I can't really, it's too small. And <laughs> this one, this one finally is uh, my thanks to him. And I, uh, I thought that, you see, you see my mistake? I thought it was in Rome at that point. So uh, the, uh, and there, uh, I, so I told you all of this, okay? So this is what this one is. He made that mistake. I just wanted to show you this. It's an installation that, has the, is the whole tra installation in fact put there? I don't even know that. No, I don't think my research assistant put the whole installation there. See, right after that, he's just put the emails. Yeah. The, the installation, in fact, slowly makes it from, uh, you know, it's an, in, it's, a, it's an installation. You know, conceptual art and architecture, these have very pre-critical theories of the subject, as if what the artist wants, the intending artist or the intending architect as if that can be in the text, is pathetic. But that's what he's doing, like most conceptual art here. It's, he's, it's, it's a representation of a scene of teaching, okay? So it begins with the O's filled out, etc. Slowly, it's a stencil, slowly it becomes the real writing. That's what it is. Okay, good. So that's all I wanted to say about that. And uh, the, it, but this also reflects, you know, the desire of the artist because he wouldn't understand if I tried to explain all of this stuff about his they not being a mistake, although in English it was two, etc., he'll just say, I'm sorry, my English is just not good. It's not as good as yours. I'm sorry I made it. Someone might have told him already. But, at any, but to me, it's crucially important because it really teaches me a great deal about those constitutive borders. It's a, a small word. It's a sin category. At any rate, so uh, uh, to go back, I would say that this then is the practical set of uh, that I'm talking about. Remember, I said that the quantification, which is supposed to be, uh, and you know, the organizing and the uh, digitalization, etc., which is supposed to be the most practical, that is in fact the ivory tower. If you don't see that it is existing within a kind of um, a kind of scene which you have to ignore in order to decide, in order to beg the question and decide that this is all there is to it. So let me talk about the practical a little bit and I'm going to summarize Kant, you will excuse me. 
the, uh, it can't, as, my, as I understand it, suggests that there is a kind of, there is, a kind, there is in us a programming which wishes to declare freedom and cause. There is in us a programming. Now, the word de anlage is his word. The, uh, there is in us something like that which wishes to declare freedom and cause, okay? That we are free to do things and that things have causes. This is something that we must think. Otherwise, uh, life would become impossible for us. Therefore, now this programming was not acceptable to the British 18th century, so that the English translations completely ignore this side and psychologize Kant, okay? I mean, from the 18th century to today. But today, thanks to our notions of genetic inscription and so on, we are not so alien to the, I mean, I have a spinal stenosis, which arose from sciatica, and now I have it pretty badly. What happened when I was, uh, uh, what, I don't have children, so I don't know, is it at five months that the back uh, straightens of the child? Whatever age it is, those of you who have children will know that it's a very early age, right? At that point, my lowest lumbar vertebra read the genetic inscription wrong, and one side became sacral. In other words, in, rather than being like a, like a nut thing, it became like a wing screw. And so the hole uh, through the pelvic girdle through which the great sciatic nerve passes didn't have much room. So who read that inscription wrong? What is the lymphatic system mind? People think about these questions these days, eh? especially neurobiologists. They think about these questions. So to an extent, the idea that there might be a kind of programming without necessarily thinking God, is, it is possible and that's what, uh, and I don't want to turn it into science as people turn into science in that other understanding of rational, uh, choice pre-modern science, as it were, the you know the, uh, people turn the uh, the deny the imagination. People turn yoga into science. Uh, it's it's that's an idiotic thing to do. It's a it's a it's a wonderful triumph of the imagination to think the inside of the body when all you know is musculature. You don't even know the cir circulation system. So if from that point of view, I would say that when he says this, he therefore uh, the next. Um, the next step is, of course, that the human being cannot access reason as such. Unless you beg the question, you cannot have these reasonable projects that are all that you need to do. You know, translation studies understood uh, within its frame by denying the, uh, uh, within what it's framed within, what kind of world it's framed within. Eh? Okay, what languages are, and the fact that English is an access to globality, which is now, which now makes the distinction between mother tongue and, I mean, we did it because as my Chinese friends told me in Kunming, because the British had, a hey, sister, you speak Chinese so well. They were, they, I was talking to managing directors, eh? I've uh, written this too. And uh, because they had to get into a WTO, World Trade Organization. And uh, so the guy says to me, you speak English so well because the British had your boot, had their boot on your neck. And I said, you know, brother, you're right. But the thing is, I, I, we changed that situation by learning to love the language and reading poetry, which is why I'm learning Chinese, you know, so that I can read the extraordinary poetry in your language, not because you're global. And so in the same way, you have the boot of the WTO on the back of your neck right now. That's why you're in this room. So change it, change it, love English. So to an extent, this is what's happening with English, right? It's, a, it's, it's undoing the distinction between mother tongue and foreign language. So what I was trying to say then is that if one keeps it within that, uh, within that begging of the question, then in fact, one is going behind Kant as it were. So the, uh, Kant is suggesting, just describing the way he sees himself, unfortunately, that is also a problem, but after all, we are still doing the same thing. We take ourselves as standing in for all human beings. He is saying that we cannot not want to say we are free to think and act, and that there are reasons for, there's a cause, and he calls this practical. 
reason, okay? This is practical reason. Otherwise, we cannot do anything because the true, true understanding, actually, be, and what is understanding modeled on for Kant? Analogy of the body. Hey, the body gets all of these uh, impressions and it's connected together into an impression. That's what the understanding works on. It's got nothing to do with the, the incredible power of the human mind because the human mind cannot access reason as such. It must assume reason as such, but it cannot access reason as such. No claim to objectivity. So to that extent, I mean, I could go on and on about Kant, but I'm not going to. So uh, to me, this is the kind of, this is the kind of uh, scene of practicality. This is the staging of the practical set within which I'm trying to think about the, uh, I'm trying to think about the place of not just translation studies, but anything which thinks, any kind of knowing which thinks that the idea of knowledge is knowledge about knowledge. So it's not, it's not denying the fact that, you know, I was, I just listened, and I have that paper as well here with me, I just listened to a Taiwanese young woman who has read Saba Mahmood, who is not part of your reading list, but uh, she, uh, Saba Mahmood is a woman who teaches at Berkeley, who from her place in the Bay Area in the United States is saying that when Muslim women identifying with any kind of gender oppression become Muslims, they are actually showing a certain kind of agency which criticizes the West. I think that's very dangerous stuff. And not, I'm not alone there. As I say, this is why there are Islamic feminists fighting within Pakistan, not in San Francisco, uh, within Pakistan for a certain kind of uh, secular justice who, uh, with whom I join my forces. Now this young, and Saba Mahmoud, of course, of course, since she writes out of uh, the, the Bay Area and she's loved by people who want to think we must criticize the West critique of Eurocentrism than which there is no more uh, bad faith idea coming from uh, United States validation, the people read her. So this innocent Taiwanese uh, researcher, she has presented, and I have the paper, a detailed uh, picture of marriage brokers so that uh, women in Vietnam and other areas and certain uh, parts of the Philippine, uh, uh, Philippines are willingly marrying people from Taiwan so that they can be, they can go into a richer uh, and more um, advanced country, learning Chinese and so on, smiling, the parents know, and you know, they're dressed nicely, good wedding, etc. And this Taiwanese um, researcher is suggesting, following Saba Mahmood, that this is a criticism of the West because this is actually the idea of agency in the third world, using that completely old and defunct phrase, you, the third world feminist agency, which the West does not recognize. In other words, marriage, accepting marriage brokership is in fact, a sign of agency. So all of this, you know, the idea that any kind of rational behavior, so, small rational behavior, without the frame, and with, so, so that the, Viet, the uh, Taiwanese woman's research, which is being funded by the Weatherhead Institute of uh, Asian Studies at Columbia, is precisely the same kind of thing where we have uh, uh, translation studies within a frame which takes itself as an unquestioned good. And so the, because I believe in the usefulness of translation studies, because I believe in the impulse of this Taiwanese woman to find a way not simply to take the model of the excellence of the intending subject uh, who thinks that the ability to use a life support system is civilization, the, because I believe in these things, therefore from within, I will keep on doing the broken record of distinguishing between translation errors, which I just spoke about at great length, distinguishing Palomino's thing, and distinguishing Birbhum from other kinds of errors where you think you are the mark of human nature and you reduce something to you, but the do-it-yourselfers will not let you get away with it, the most artificial one. 
so therefore, I will go on saying this so that you think that question, the very old Latin question, cui bono? That's the question. I'm not making this up, um, Gayatri Spivak, deconstruction, no. Cui bono? That is the question that one must still ask, not just, isn't it good to do this? So, now I'm going to go to the gender business, okay? Now, I've been talking about abstraction, hmm? what we call quantification, Marx called uh, the average, the abstract average, remember? And I'll, I'll just hit Marx uh, one more uh, time and then go. Remember, I think international socialism has failed, certainly uh, communism has failed in my state after 34 years, and correctly so. But that the what Marx is talking about, though, is, uh, which was given up very, very quickly, it just became about job security. Marx is saying that quantification, and the Americans completely misunderstood this, romantic anti-capitalism, so did, so did um, um, Lukács misunderstand it. The Marx is saying that it is a good idea to quantify. And that's what labor power is, the abstract average. The only difference is, and Marx is emphasizing intending subject because he's talking about practice. Or the, he never thought through how it would be, why the working class, having, having received this freedom from exploitation, would want to, want to have freedom to do good to others. This one needs ethical, uh, ethical interference of the sort I'm talking about. It never happened, everything went to hell. So at any rate, so the idea is that the worker should willingly quantify. That was, it's nothing to do with any alien nation of labor or anything. Alienation is a Hegelian word, which is a good word for uh, producing, uh, moving along the dialectic, no problem. So at any rate, so he, the worker should willingly quantify and use quantified labor to produce capital and turn it around for the social, okay? so. This particular abstraction, it takes its place, whether you're Marxist, anti-Marxist, or anything, with all of these projects that I talked about, which takes reason to be, the public use of reason, reason small r, whereas Kant, the grandfather who was talking about the public use of reason, put reason within boundaries, broke it in three, into four, and put the practical reason which says freedom and cause, which allows the intending subject to act in the space of an intended mistake or a programmed mistake, which is even more, uh, more so that you can't distinguish between, uh, we call it a normative deviation. You can't distinguish between a mistake and the right thing there. It's underived mistake. There is no other way to be, to want to be free and to want to be, uh, to want to be, to want to, find out causes, okay? So that's the scene of practicality, most powerful because it acknowledges its limits rather than oppress others as impractical if they try to say, look, it's all held within a space where to produce syllogisms is not the, the greatest sign of human excellence. A goat can produce it, not to, not to mention a chimpanzee. So anyway, now, uh, the, the, uh, the argument that has been made, oh goodness, I've lost my watch. The argument, oh dear, oh dear, uh, 50, uh, 50 minutes. I'll stop right here. So let me summarize, and then tomorrow what we'll do is we'll look at the pictures of, pictures of, uh, pictures of um, uh, the gender stuff, right? So the argument then that I would like to make, and I ask for five minutes to uh, go toward tomorrow, the, to summarize, uh, the, what I'm, I will argue tomorrow is that gender is, and I've written about this all over the place, is our first instrument of abstraction. Because, and I cited some stuff yesterday already, because when we begin pre-sentient to distinguish between plus and minus, the whatever we, ca we can as adults think through, the only real plus and minus accessible to us is sexual difference in the most, most basic sense, not gender difference, sexual difference, 
that we are sitting on different kinds of sexual equipment. That's the difference that is accessible to us. And so in terms of this, the relationship between the sacred and the profane are organ is organized and a social formation begins. Gender is our first instrument of abstraction, although it is dismissed as the empirical as such. Even feminists do that and they're wrong. At the same time, I will argue tomorrow, and I want to prepare the ground for it, gender is also what has been called the dangerous supplement. Now the idea of the supplement is that you know exactly the kind of hole that there is in the thing that you are trying to correct. Exactly the sh hole, the shape of the hole. As I say, being a socialist myself, a pacifist internationalist socialist, I say that socialism has an ethics-shaped hole, and I know what I'm talking about, what that shape is. You ask me a question, one can go much further. Someone else, uh, in fact, Franco Nazi was talking, I think, about um, uh, unconditional hospitality, and I said, no, this is where I do not agree with, uh, with the idea. Hospitality is different from the kind of unconditional ethics that I was talking about there, right? So I'm, I have a sense, having been a socialist from within, of the kind of hole, I may not be right, but the, I, I have a sense, which is open to all the criticisms that I have been giving so far, but it is for you to judge. The, if you can, so it, there is an ethics-shaped hole within socialism. Now, if you want to supplement, you will have to produce something which exactly fits that hole. It will never exactly fit, but nonetheless, that's what supplementation means, not just you add on something. You know, so that, from that point of view, gender is the dangerous supplement to our pride in reasonableness, the abstraction of gender that gives us the possibility of, you know, I mean, if I were Edward Said, he also was university professor in the humanities standing here, and he also had many, many lovers. You think anybody would have dared to make a joke about his sex life? No. He would have killed you. He would have said, first of all, you wouldn't have dared to do so. The, you wouldn't have dared to do so. But he would have killed you and he would have said, sorry, I'm not going to give my talks. Uh, put me on a plane right now. So to an extent, there is, and he and I were in the same place. He was more famous for very good reasons. He deserved to be more famous than I. But institutionally, we were in the exact same place, the only university professor in the humanities. So gender has this thing. On the one side, as our first instrument of abstraction, it organizes society in such a way that you have reasonableness as such. On the other hand, because within gendering, you can, violence can be desired. This is a very dangerous supplement.